So you're on. This is the uh, lecture number 13. And uh, for those who, all the weather, couldn't make it, a book of uh, Daniel two weeks ago, we dealt with the issue of uh, not only uh, the future plans or the messianic era, but also the prophecy of Daniel. Um, the difference that that book made particularly in the comparison religion and a relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Uh, last week, we dealt with the book of Ezra. And uh, what we describe Ezra is uh, one of the most important leaders in the Jewish world that ever had. I involved my personal opinion last week that if I was the one in charge of production or or building characters of biblical people, Ezra was number one. Uh, but um, for sure, we're not comparing um, people and images. But the Talmud said that if Ezra uh, lived in the time of Moses, he was the one who deserved to receive the Torah. But as far as budget is concerned, and building the building, it was not involved with anything fancy schmancy or any serious budget. Is another lesson that we already learned, and the rabbis dwell on that a lot, is the lesson of tremendous koach ha the power of the faith and the power of the prayer. That uh, Nehemiah was able to institute and, and register in the mind of people the faith in themselves and the faith in the future for the Jewish people and faith in God. And again, here we are, the beginning, people were very depressed between those elderly people that forced out of the land and saw the destruction, and then they came back with Ezra, and they cry a lot to see what's going on in Jerusalem, and now they stop, when they stop them from building the temple, and they have a fight with the Samaritans and the Kutites. Through the young people, we again frustrated between the hope for the future, to see something happening, while they're stuck with all those problems. So, in a way, Nehemiah was the entity of Mashiach, or Messiah, in a sense, of uh, make things happen and give hope to people. Now, chapter 8, in a way, is a little bit aftermath. Between chapter 1 to 8 is the whole procedure of how they build the walls around the city so it will be protected, the license that he received, special license from the king, um, the, uh, the conflict that they have, etc. But then, Nehemiah called for a very special meeting. He called the rich people and he said, look, that's what's going to happen and that's the way the business is going to take place from now on. There is money all the king of Persia over a lot of expenses that was involved here. As the, the powerful authority that that the king gave me, I am willing and ready to make deal with you. In other words, he's talking with a carrot and stick to them. He said, look, if you want nicely to erase the debt of those two people, it's fine. If you don't want to do that, here it goes. You need to pay a tremendous amount of taxes to the king of Persia. And if you want me to erase those taxes, you need to erase the money that the poor people owe you. How does that sound? And he goes further to say, whoever willing to accept that, it's fine. Whoever is not willing to accept that, you need to pay a very high price that is really not worth it for you not to accept. And why he was so strong and mean to the rich people? It was so bad, if you read the chapter, and you're welcome to read it later, 
it was a Jewish slavery, which means those people who were so poor, some of them, because they owe money to the, um, the uh, landlords or the other rich people, they sold the children as a slave in exchange for their debt. Nehemiah couldn't tolerate that. So he felt that this destroyed all the um, uh, social life or all the ingathering of the people, ingathering of exile, if we, we have a social situation like that. How in the world you build a good united city of Jews and temple and, and somehow framework of, of worshiping and rituals if you have such a, uh, um, a crisis in the community. So at the beginning, he was in that language. Later on, he turned to be much stronger. And he started putting excommunication and ban and all kind of huge sum of money and punishment upon the rich, which eventually he was able to, to expunge, to, to annul those situations, such as uh, selling children uh, for paying debts, such as uh, tremendous poverty, etc. Ezra, here in the chapter 8, in co cooperate with Nehemiah. Nehemiah tried to tell people, look, the sin that you have here at this time, and the reason that I believe you don't have all these help, is because you people are not get along, and not make things happen for each other. You're not holding a sick a family that care for each other. He says, it starts with the idea of lack of faith, or lack of believing in, in the Torah and God and, and the foundation of our faith. So what did he do? Chapter 8. He gathered together, he assembled all the people. The entire people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. And they ask Ezra, this Ezra the scribe, if you remember we explained why Ezra is called the scribe, it's because he's not only a scribe, but he's the one who uh, put the Torah in the right writing, which means from the time of Ezra and onward, when we write the Torah, we depend upon the writing of Ezra, which is, is no, before Ezra it was two Torahs with few words in different in the, in the writings. Ezra make it clear, so it's called the scribe, that's one of the reasons. So, they called the, the scroll of the Torah of Moses, which God had commanded to Israel. And everybody was there. And he read and he explained and made sure that women, the children, simply, they all understand it. Ezra stood up on the, the uh, uh, wooden platform made especially for the occasion. And all these people around him, sent as five. And Ezra started his speech with blessing God, and <coughs> then he expressed himself in a very clear way, which is blessing and curses. This is very much in the book of Deuteronomy, the same idea. He said to them, if you listen to God and the law of God and you keep the covenant, and God helped you to return from the exile, and after those elderly people saw the ashes of the old temple, now is a chance to rebuild it, Fine. If not, then problem. So sentences 1 to 12, it turns that Ezra is basically the broker between people and, 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 uh, and the text. Sentence 9 to 12 describes the reaction of people. People get very um, overwhelmed and start crying. They cried because of many reasons. First of all, the poverty. Second of all, the understanding that something wrong happened. Third, understanding the, the whole situation. So he said, look, this is not the time to, for crying. That's not the proper time. That's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is be together. He said the sentence 10. That's not Judaism to sit and cry now. That's not what we are looking for. Go and eat. And, and drink. Some say that that was the festival of Sukkot. Later on, we see that it was also a time of Sukkot that they gathered the assembly festival. He says, if you decided that you're going to change your way, 
you're going to get together, you're going to appoint it to the priests that have the proper lineage and the Levites they're going to serve. And you're going to unite against the enemies here. And you're going to build together the temple. So there's no reason for you to cry now. There's a reason for you to be together and, and, and help each other. Build the security and safety. If you promise to each other that it's going to be social equal rights in the sense of, of justice, then things will turn for good. And then from sentences 13 to 18, it's a description of festival of Sukkot, which for sure it was a big gathering. As a side note, if you see the sentence uh, uh, 15, is a description of the um, mitzvot of Sukkot, such as sitting in a sukkah, having the four species. There are minor difference in the four species. The Samaritans in their religion hold the way that in Nehemiah hold. We hold it in a minor difference in the four species, which is a different topic. But basically, they celebrated the Sukkot together. So what we see so far is Ezra is a religious leader, a spiritual leader, uh, someone who can um, um, give the people the, the spiritual need, the spiritual hope. And Nehemiah is pragmatic, is a very, very, very outspoken and strong leadership that makes things happen, not always in a nice way, and not always in the way that everybody is going to like him. But Nehemiah makes things happen. Now, there is a lot of tension in the, in the um, chapter 9, 10, 11 is a description of, of great tension. First, with the enemies. There are people who are not Jewish. We mentioned before the three main leaders of the enemies who were looking for troubles. First, they continue their instigation and they constantly said that the Jewish people are doing that in order to rebel against the Persian king. And for sure there are many non-Jewish people who believe in them and want to fight the Jews. So Nehemiah, beside of building the, the walls and building the temple, he needs now to build some sort of defense army or defense people that can hold any potential fights with the people because he cannot return to Persia as he promised the king before he established some sort of security system for the people who are going to stay there in Jerusalem. Again, the beauty of Nehemiah, throughout the text, he never took a penny to his pocket in the sense of leadership. On the other hand, you see that he is asking God always in a personal level, which the rabbi didn't like. And he asked God to remember him for good, to do good for him, because he was so honest and so good in his leadership, etc. The Kabbalah, the Arizal, I just give you a, a hint in the Kabbalah, there are several people who always like to hear these words. The Ari of the 16th century, which again is uh, it's enigmatic statement, he held that the reason that about four, five hundred years ago it separated into two books, originally it was one book of Ezra, it's because from heaven they said that he was forgiven. Nehemiah was forgiven for that sin. And therefore, it was a decision to make it as a two books, which again, you can take it or leave it, but that's the Kabbalistic interpretation for the reason that in our times it's like two books, same in a way, two semios. The influence of Nehemiah was um, his sincerity. The fact that he was so sincere in his um, way create trust on people. And people felt that he, he meant it. Because he protected the poor so strongly, and because he walked day and night for the people, and in the person level, he was the same um, um, low income as all the others, um, people appreciate him and hold him. So, for example, he instituted the whole idea of Shabbat observing Shabbat, and that's go throughout the book of Ezra and Nehemiah many times. He holds that we as a Jewish community cannot be together if we're not observing our own ritual, our own uh, covenant. And since Shabbat is the one of the basic foundation of our faith, he holds the people, and he was in a different language than Ezra. Ezra was in a language of talking to people the, the value of Shabbat, convince them the value of Shabbat, etc. And people close their stores. 
Nehemia was more in ultimatum. He said, either you are on my side or on the other side. If you're not going to observe Shabbat, you will not belong to my community, you're not part of my side, and you're not going to fight it. If you're going to divide it over any subject, it's not going to happen. Either we're all going to observe Shabbat or not. It's not going to happen. So basically he, in a way, made things happen not exactly the way or even the opposite way that the Ezra made things happen. But again, he was a religious man and he meant well for the people. The same with the issue of intermarriages, which is close to the end of the book of Nehemiah. Yes, we read in Ezra that he convinced people to divorce their, their spouse who were not Jewish in order to build a community. However, Nehemiah again is a language of ultimatum, which is either you build a unity as a community, as a unity of people, or you cannot have temple. He says, how you will be able to build a priesthood that needs to be a lineage to the Aaron, the high priests? How you build the Levites that need to have a lineage, genealogical uh, lineage to their ancestors if people marry out of faith? It can't be like that. And he says, pick and choose. Either you're divorcing your spouse, or you're not a Kohen, or you're not a lady, you're not part of the, this community. So he was, um, he has a different um, methodology of speaking to people. You like it or dislike it. That was Nehemiah, and he made things happen. Now, uh, he was very uh, strong and zealous in his decision, which means when he made a decision, made up his mind and made those rules, no one escaped from them. So, for example, he decided to take a census. So, is any, anybody that have any objections, always pick and choose. Either you're part of us or you're not part of us. Um, in our language, in our times, when I read that book, I must share it in a little personal uh, observations. And among the Hasidic sect, you know that there are different Hasidic sects, there is a Hasidim that called Ger Hasidim, Gur, a very large uh, uh, amount of um, families, some said few thousands families. So the previous of the previous Ger Rebbe, the rabbis of Gur, made takanot, made a rules for the Hasidic community, which means if you want to be part of the Hasidic sect of Gur, you have to follow those rules. Namely, if you marry your child, you cannot invite more than 150 people to the wedding, which applies to our time too. It's already about at least 15 years. Uh, since the previous rabbi, but you're not allowed. You are violating the rules of the society. You're not allowed, even if you are the richest person in the world, to buy an apartment in Jerusalem earlier than five years after they got married. You must go to one of those places around Israel and not buying in Jerusalem. So he tried to create some sort of social um, justice or social balance among his Hasidim. And for his uh, segregated sect, he was very successful because his successor, the two Hasidic rabbis, followed that rules. But he made those boundaries and those rules that, uh, in a way, it was an ultimatum to the Hasidim. You're either one of our group or you're not. So when I read Nehemiah, I felt very much connected to those rules of the Ger Rebbe because um, it's hard, especially in our times, in democracy and then people. Um, uh, there are people, who are not uh, capitalistic, but there are people who, who live um, in different uh, way of life, and there are people who are poor. And it's very hard for any leader to make some sort of, uh, of justice when it's come to this. But um, Nehemiah make it happen because of the situation, because he saw where, came, where they came from, and because he has the power to make things happen. But he used his power in the Atmos, to make things happen. Now, the end was not so rosy, which means eventually, i just give you again the abbreviation of the very end of this book, and you're welcome to read um, um, the whole story. Um, he went back to Babylon, and uh, the high priest, whose name is Eliashib, was again connected somehow toward relatives and, 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 and friends to the enemies. And he allowed in the chamber of the priesthood 
to have guns and ammunition and all kind of things in those days, I mean, the ammunition to take place in the temple, etc. And again, it was issues of, I don't like to use the word corruption, but issues of not being, not following the Hemian's rules and regulations, rather it rules and regulations that he built over the 12 years there. So yes, the walls around the city remains, but the service in the temple, the functioning of the service and the proper decorum and order that Nehemiah Institute was different. It's like Hillel said, when Im Anisha, if I'm not there, then when daddy and mommy are not home, then things happen, like it or not. Which, again, forced Nehemiah, just give you the abbreviation later on, to go back to Israel and do a lot of unpleasant things to straighten out those problems. But in a way, when he was there, things were fine and good. And then when he left, it wasn't the way that he, he expected it. So uh, just some point, I want to glance over chapter 13, and then we go to your questions. Chapter 13. Sentence 14. You remember we talk about his personal. He repeats that sentence several times. Remember me, he talks to God, favorably for this, my God, and do not blot out the devotion I show to the temple of my God and its attendance. The rabbis didn't like that. Now, sentence 15, he saw what's going on on Shabbat, he didn't like it. He said, that's not the way it's going to function. Sentence 17, so what did he do? I criticize the noble of Judah, saying to them, what evil thing is this that you're doing, performing the Shabbat day? Your ancestors did that and create destruction. 19, when shadows clothe at the gateways of Jerusalem, at the approach of the Shabbat, I gave orders that the doors be closed in order that they not reopen until after the Shabbat. I stationed some of my young men at the gates to ensure that no goods will enter the city on the Shabbat. Right? Sentence 23, another thing that he made, not in a pleasant way. Also at this time I saw the Jews had married Ashodotite, Ammonite, and Moabite women. Quite a number of the children spoke the language of Ashdod and the language of those various people, and I did not know how to speak the language of, of Judah. 25. I criticized them, cursed them, Plugged them, tore out their hair, and I jowled them by God, saying, You shall not give your daughter to their son, or take any of their daughters for your son or yourself. And eventually he was successful. But again, the end of the book, he repeated that sentence so many times, and he said, My God, remember it to my credit. So, as we said, originally speaking, it wasn't the book of Nehemiah. It's all, and you see the commentator, the early commentators of the 9, 10, 11, 12th century, they're referring only to the book of Ezra, but they're referring to the text that we call today Nehemiah 2, which as I said before, it's about four or 500 years old that they separate the two books. One is Ezra, one is Nehemiah. So in conclusion, that's some point. If we try to make some sense of the difference between the Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we see that um, they are both accomplished a lot, but in a very different methodology and different ways. Um, Ezra was a spiritual leader, was a soft, in a sense, leader. He made things happen, but um, um, he made things happen in, 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 a, in a way that people um, accepted him because of, he's like Aaron the high priest, the rabbi compared him. Um, Nehemiah has a uh, strong personality and, and very persevere, uh, strong leadership. 
All the rabbis and the, the scholars agree that Nehemiah accomplished tremendous amount. Um, he accomplished the building of the walls around the city. He accomplished by um, making a unity among the Jews. He, he, um, he was a man of, of deeds. Uh, he, he, uh, he established the rules of the Shabbat and the holidays, uh, the, the assimilation issues, uh, to get the license. And the most important thing, he get the license for Jews to have an autonomy in Jerusalem, later from the king of Persia. It's a side note, a side question, which we don't uh, deal now, how big the size of Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah, and what happened. There are many who hold that Jerusalem was a very small, tiny city. There are others who hold that it's up to Shara Gai and go to the big city. Most of the experts hold that it was a tiny city, but he has a very good management way to have all the people leave whoever are capable to be, to walk, to do what needed in the city. And the rest he sent to a uh, suburban area. So my dear friends, you see the importance of learning this book of Nehemiah. I never understand why it's not so much PR and marketing over the book of Ezra, Daniel, and Nehemiah. Daniel, you have some, but um, no comparison to the five books of Moses. But um, as you see, there is a, uh, so much to learn from, from those books, from Ezra, Nehemiah, and, and Daniel, not only in the sense of learning the history of our people, but also understanding that uh, a lot of um, situations and phenomena that we have in our time, in a way it's a reoccurrence of early situations that happened already to our people in those days. Now, um, where are we going from now? Last week, we said that we're going to have uh, those books, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, as the last series. Next week, it will be the last one for the all 14 weeks of learning Tanakh. So next week, we're going to have the book of Chronicles. And just two words for the book of Chronicles. Oh, the book of Chronicles, it's basically two books. It's a big, heavy book. And it's basically the diary and the abbreviation of the whole, uh, the other 22 books of the Tanakh, which makes altogether 24 books. However, there are a lot of contradictions. First, between the first and the second book of Chronicles. Second, between the events and evidence in the Bible and the book of Chronicles. Plus, there are a lot of things that happen that are not mentioned in the book of Chronicles. So, as much as time allow, Next week will be the last lecture in this series, which will deal in general in the book of Chronicles. And as I said all the time, so I really urge and encourage you to read the book of Chronicles, especially from this excellent book, uh, The Living Nach, uh, so you have more background. Then we take like one week break, and we start in the month of February a series of lectures. This time, I mean, half an hour difference, we will start at 7.30 instead of 7. And it's going to be a series of lectures, you see the flyer. So basically the seventh for Tuesday will be the last, the last one will be next week on Tuesday at 7 o'clock, Book of Chronicles. Any question? Please, I'm not taking it.